When we're talking about projectile motion or any type of two-dimensional motion, one of the first things you need to think about is your acceleration. And in particular, the kinematics equations that we first uh, learned about and derived for one-dimensional motion that we're typically going to apply for two-dimensional motion is only true for constant acceleration. In the case of projectile motion, we do have constant acceleration. This isn't going to be true if air resistance is something you need to factor in. So as long as air resistance is negligible, we do have a situation with constant acceleration, which is good. So we need to define what our acceleration vector is. And the definition of projectile motion is that we only have acceleration due to gravity. So that's going to be our gravitational acceleration, which is in the downwards direction. So we call that minus y. And we don't have any acceleration in the x direction. So this is really important. We have two components to think about, what's happening in x and what's happening in y. And in x, we don't have any acceleration. We're going to need to come back to that and use that. In y, we define this acceleration as negative g. And that's the same thing as saying we have g in the negative y hat direction, right? That's equal to negative g y hat. And what we could do instead of writing just the magnitude of the acceleration in y, I could write my y direction acceleration component vector, and that would be minus g y hat. So now this is something really important. Remember that g is 9.8 meters per second squared. In particular, it's plus 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, one thing that you might get tripped up by is if you sometimes just put negative 9.8 meters per second squared for g, and then you put this minus sign here, those minus signs cancel. So always have g be positive so that your direction, the negative y hat direction, the down direction, is what gives you that minus sign. So g is a positive constant, and then the direction gives you that minus sign. Okay? So what this means, and we can think through this a little bit, is that as we track our object, and in this case, this is a motion diagram on top of a trajectory. Remember that that's useful since the trajectory itself don't, does not tell you any time information, but the motion diagram starts to. That we have our initial velocity vector here, and again, we can define some sort of launch angle theta. And we see that our velocity vector is changing. So let's now think through how it's changing in x and how it's changing in y. Note that this figure has the y component of velocity labeled to the left and the x component of velocity labeled below. And that in every case, your x component is always the same. Or over here, apparently, it switches above. So if this is my x component here, Notice that it is always the same. And the reason for that is that this is zero. Our acceleration in x is zero. And remember that that is the change in our x component of velocity with respect to time. So that must not be changing. So then the other component to think about is our y direction. And here, it's actually zero. And then it goes downwards. So in this case, we do see that it's changing. Our y component vector gets smaller, becomes zero, and then starts increasing in size in the downwards direction. And if we just thought about what the y component was doing, that would look identical to free fall. So when we're talking about projectile motion, the acceleration in the y direction is completely equivalent to the free fall scenario. So the motion in y is completely equivalent to free fall. However, we also have uniform motion in x where our velocity is constant. So please keep this in mind, understanding this separate condition for acceleration and understanding the two separate models for motion we can use. Uniform motion, i.e. constant velocity in x because acceleration is zero, and then free fall in y, a constant acceleration in negative g. We're going to keep coming back to this because that is the key. That is the, the magic uh, password for how to actually do this type of projectile motion.
So now I want to apply what we just talked about to an example situation. I'm not going to work through this completely. I just want to talk through the setup. And the situation is that there's, for instance, filming a movie and a car is being driven off a cliff. And we know the initial speed that the car has. And the question is, how far from the base of the cliff, which we would model just as perfectly vertical like this, does the car land? So now this is a common projectile motion question. And one thing that I want to point out is even though you don't see the entire parabola, it is part of a parabola. The way to recognize that this is projectile motion is that the only thing affecting the motion of the car during the time in the air is gravity. So it's projectile motion. So in this case, note that a trajectory plot is being drawn and the car is being sketched on top of it. So things that are being labeled on this trajectory plot include the initial velocity, which is perfectly horizontal, because the car, in this case, has uniform motion in x, and then the acceleration vector, which is constant once it's in the air. So there's a few things to think about here. There's many things we know, there's many things we don't know, and then the question is, what are we trying to find? So the first thing is that we do know the initial position. Because this is a two-dimensional problem, we need to think about both the position in x and y. Now, we also want to set an initial time. So even though time doesn't appear in our trajectory plot, we need to keep track of time. And the next video is going to talk about how we actually use time is really the key to doing projectile motion after we've separated it into components. So we also have two components of our initial velocity. Again, this is 2D, so you need to have both X and Y. And again, you actually aren't explicitly told in the problem, this is the X component, this is the Y component. But you know that if it's driving horizontal off the cliff, that your initial speed was actually entirely in the X direction. So once you have a problem this complicated, it is very, very helpful to start making these tables that are your knowns, and then potentially your unknowns, but also what you're trying to find. And so before I jump down there, I want to at least talk about the second thing you need to label, at least in this type of situation, which is the place where it lands. There is a different 2D position. There is a different velocity vector, which has two components when it lands. And now there's some time that it has when it lands. And again, I'll come back to this in a future video. But let's talk about the knowns now. So we can define the starting position as zero. That's just nice and convenient. Let's say it starts at zero. That's right there. Now, if we say, what is its starting height? 10 meters. This is the height of your cliff. That's something that needs to be in the problem, unless that's what you're actually trying to find. Now then we have our initial y component of velocity, which is zero, because again, it's traveling perfectly horizontal. We can set our initial time to be zero. That's very convenient. We don't need to add any time. And we have an initial speed that would be given to you in, in this situation of 20 meters per second. Now note here that what the book has done is said that v0x equals v0. And again, we've said that it our initial speed, we know that that's 20 meters per second, and since it's aimed perfectly horizontal, basically we're saying theta equals zero, right? Theta equals zero. So don't get tripped up on trying to find some theta here. Again, the completely wrong thing to do is draw a right triangle and relate that to theta. Theta equals zero because that's your angle of your initial velocity vector with respect to the horizontal. Since it's perfectly horizontal, theta equals zero. Then, the other things that you probably want to label are your accelerations. And again, you might think that this is trivial and you don't need to write them down, but a really common mistake that people make in projectile motion is that they, for instance, start writing weird things for acceleration in x. So please write down that the acceleration in x is zero. You know that. There's nothing acting on it that way. The acceleration in y, well, that's negative g, because that's how we're defining it. The last thing that you might actually need to think about, it's not explicitly going to be told to you, is that we can define our, our final position. In this case, the, the notation being used in this problem is y0 for initial, y1 for final, as zero meters. So we're defining this final height as zero, 
which is why our initial height was equal to 10. So one thing to note is that if we wanted to talk about a change in y, that would be y final minus y initial, which in this case is 0 meters minus 10 meters. And so our delta y is negative 10 meters. And be careful about this, since sometimes people mess up their signs. And again, that's where writing these things out explicitly can be really helpful. So now I want to talk about acceleration and what's happening with velocity. So first, is our x component of velocity changing with time? Well, no, because our acceleration in that direction is zero. So if I wanted to actually specify what v1 of x is, well, v1 of x is just equal to v0 of x, which we said was v0. Now, you don't actually need to use that in this problem, necessarily. It's not changing, but you do know it. Now, the second question is if the y component of velocity is changing with time. And the answer here is yes. The y component is changing. Why is that? Because you have an acceleration. So remember that in this case, you do have a changing value of y, uh, of the y component of velocity. And so maybe the question would ask you uh, something about the speed when it hits the ground. Normally, you don't need to worry about it. You might want to use it in your calculation, depending on what you're actually trying to calculate. So the last question that I do, that I think is a little more subtle, is whether our total speed, i.e. the magnitude of our velocity vector, is changing with time. And the answer here is yes, because the magnitude of our velocity vector is being given by our x component squared plus our y component squared, square rooted, and we know that the y component is changing with time. So the speed as the car travels through the air is actually increasing. So one question you might be asked is what is the speed of the car as it hits the ground? And in that case, you would need to find what your y component is since you know what your x component is originally, or already, sorry. So please think through this carefully. And again, there's a lot of variables to keep track of. And it's really important that you draw a good picture and you write these out explicitly to begin with.